Hello, good evening and welcome. My name is John Drummond and this is the TNT Show, The Nation Talks. And every week we guarantee you, and this is no exception, we guarantee you 60 exciting minutes. And these, these minutes, Kevin, you may have to put your, your mute on. <laughs> Thanks. A, a small technical glitch, folks. These things happen in the, even in the best ordered lives. Uh, you know, it's been another great day for British democracy. There are reports, listen to this, there are reports that a journalist, and I use the expression loosely, uh, by the name of Sarah Vine, reckons that the way to bring the Scots to heel is to starve them. You know, this is the 21st century. You know? uh, 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 oh, by the way, she may get her way. After all, she is married to Michael Gove. So, Look forward to interesting times. It looks like this next referendum, when it happens, is not going to be all sweetness and light. But I guess none of you thought it was going to be that way. Hey, thanks for joining us this evening. You know, we have another great guest tonight, and I'm really excited that she's able to be with us. Uh, tonight, the TNT show welcomes Dr. Marsha Scott. Now, Marsha is CEO of Scottish Women's Aid and a council member of Women for Independence and so much else besides, and you'll learn all of that tonight and more. And we're taking your questions live. Uh, thank you for any that have been submitted in advance. We'll get to those in a second. So in many respects, this is your show. The details for getting in touch, sending questions, comments, your thoughts are on the What's On guide. You go there, you'll figure ways to do it. Uh, I have my phone with me. So if you want to write to me direct at john at cliche.com, I'll look out for your emails as well. So there's lots of ways to get in touch. Make use of them uh, as best you can. Now to our guest. Tonight, the nation talks to Dr. Marsha Scott. Marsha, how are you coping with the pandemic? Well, I have to say, depends kind of what time of the day you ask me and what I, you know, whether I've been working you know, 2 million hours or not. But I do have to say, um, I think like most of Scotland and probably like most of the world, it's exhausting. And there are elements of it that you just, you just have to grit your teeth and get on with it. I do think um, that, however, my overarching answer has to be that I am so mindful of how lucky I am. Yeah. I, I haven't gotten the virus. I haven't lost anybody I love to the virus, although I know mm. that could still happen. Um, I have a steady job. I don't have to homeschool. And um, so in the grand scheme of things, I'm okay. Um, my work means that I'm really, really aware all the time of people who are not as lucky as I am. So yeah. I think that at the end of the day, that's my overarching observation. Good. Well, we'll talk about some of these folks that you're helping along the way. But tell us a little bit about yourself. Where, where were you born? Where did you grow up? What was your family like? Education? Tell us about Dr. Marshall Scott. Well, I know this will come as a surprise to everybody in the audience, given the way I speak, but I was not born in Scotland. I was born in New York. Um, uh, and on my, my mom's side, from a long line of New Yorkers, um, and I remember uh, the story about my uh, great aunt on my mother's side, who um, uh, when she heard that my, my grandmother was moving to Long Island, which was, can I say, 12 miles outside of Manhattan, um, said, she's moving to a foreign country, dear. So, you know, long, long line of New Yorkers <laughs> on one side. And um, uh, my father's family is from Kansas. So quite a, uh, quite a contrast there. So, yep, so I grew up right outside of Manhattan um, uh, and uh, in, a, in essentially um, uh, a, a old fishing community that was on the, on the uh, shoreline of uh, Long Island. Um, my mom was a single mom. My parents parted when I was three. Um, and uh, life was hard for her. Um, and I think that uh, it's, you know, formed so much of my worldview of, over yeah. the, the, my growing up years, seeing her struggle and talking with, you know, she would leave the house for work at, 
um, 6.30 in the morning and she would get home at 6.30 at night. And uh, she, had a, she had a tough road to hoe. And yet, um, you know, I think the, the, some of my very best memories growing up come from her, you know, just absolute refusal to give in to the circumstances of all of that. Um, I haven't, what, what, I haven't what did she do? Yeah. yeah. What, what did she do? What was her job? Oh, that's a funny one. She, well, so she, she was the first female, I think, in our family to go to university. Um, lots of men had, of course, but um, uh, uh, she was the first woman to. Uh, and because her, my grandfather um, uh, came home from the war in uh, World War I with tuberculosis and um, not very, had been gassed, had tuberculosis. My mother caught tuberculosis from him when she was a child. And so she wound up having to stay at home for um, a year of her school, miss a year of school because they didn't want her to be, you know, obviously to pass it on to, to the schoolmates. And um, when they tested her to go back into school, she uh, um, tested out of two years of schooling. So she wound up graduating from high school at the ripe age of 14 and went to college then. Um, and uh, she wound up with a, well, she got kicked out for behaving badly, uh, but then she got back in and she um, graduated with a degree in sociology, but it was right as World War II was starting. And, um, you know, the, the, the jobs that were available to women suddenly became very much more diverse than prior to that. So she wound up getting hired by essentially a, a number of airplane companies. Um, she wound up working for 26 years for Grumman, um, was Grumman Aircraft and then Grumman Aerospace, who built yep. the LEM module, uh, which went to the moon. And, um, but she was a sociology major. And, but the reason that she wasn't in the administration pool was because she wasn't a secretary because she had a college degree. So then they put her on the engineering track. So she spent all of her professional life as a weights engineer. Really? Yeah, I know. And her best piece of advice that I'll never forget about work working in the in the in the world once you're an adult is never tell them you can type. <laughs> and, and she was there for twenty six years. Yeah. Yep. Gracious. She must have seen quite a turnover during that time. Yeah, yeah. She had her favorite planes that she worked on, and I couldn't tell you what they were, but um, and uh, she uh, she had she was writing all the reports because she said engineers may be good at some things, but they can't write. And um, and then you know she was involved in the last years of her work uh, around the, the lunar excursion module. So. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Why? And, and how did she get on with the men at? in engineering, because it, I guess it's a pretty male, male dominated environment, I should imagine. Oh, incredibly, incredibly, still is, but um, not, not, it was even worse then. Well, she, she trained every single one of her bosses, if that tells you anything about <laughs> um, uh, uh, glass ceilings, it, Grumman yeah. Aerospace. Um, and uh, I suppose if she had, been a little bit, had come a little bit later, she probably would have been involved in some of the class action suits um, uh, around uh, discrimination on, on the basis of pay and promotion. Yeah. But it was before her time. Yeah. Uh, and then you came along and did you also go to college or? Yeah, I did. So grew up in New York and um, wound up going to university in Ohio. Um, which is in the middle of this mm -hmm. country. And I have to say, as a New Yorker, I'm terrible East Coast bias, um, I, which I probably should be more embarrassed about. Um, but uh, so going to university in Ohio is quite a transformation, you know, from, from quite an urban setting to, to a, a very uh, flat, um, uh, non-urban. Uh, so it was quite a... Um, uh, shock for me, I suppose. But yeah, so I went to a, a college, was in a college called Antioch, which was very left leaning, um, which matched my mother's politics and my politics. And uh, it was a co-op school. 
which meant that we worked six months of the year and studied six months of the year. And um, my first, well, my first job was working in a, um, a, a black community in New York where I worked in a daycare center and was one of the assistants in a classroom in trail in what you would call caravans, I think yeah. here, trailers in the States. Mm, um, sure. uh, and I worked in the two-year-olds classroom. So there were 13 two-year-olds. Mm. And I have to say with, <laughs> with three other women, I was the only white person in the place. I learned so much and I have never been so exhausted when I got home at the end of the day oh. as that job. But and my, one of the other jobs that really stuck with me was I worked for Miners for Democracy for um, uh, a period just as they were in an election for um, uh, Arnold Miller was running in a reform union election for the United Mine Workers and then for Black Lung Association for a few months after that. So those were pretty formative. I got a lot of uh, um, background on labor history and the yep. importance of it to trying to shake the foundations of capitalism. Still yeah. working on that. I mean, my sense of it is that labor relations in, uh, in the US were even more charged than they are here. I mean, because there's a, you know, there's a labor party that represent, that at that time represented working folks that perhaps not quite so much anymore, looking at the present leadership in particular, uh, which seems to be developing an affection for flags rather than sort of uh, fraternity. Uh, but my sense of it is the US labor uh, situation was much more charged than here. Um, I'm not enough of an authority on labor history, especially not in this country, um, to, to make much comment. I will say that it was it was violent. It was, yeah. uh, you know, power is never given away. You know, people always have to claim their own power. And yeah. sometimes that's that's a really um, difficult and fraught and many decades process. And yeah. I think that, um, you know, the labor movement in the U.S. right now has changed incredibly. And there's lots of, you know, evidence that it's beginning to blossom and grow again. And okay. Uh, with a very different, you know, than, it's not manufacturing jobs, it's service jobs. Um, it's a whole set. And here I am talking about it, but I actually haven't lived there in 20 years. So you'll have to ask somebody who lives there. <laughs> I was interested when you said that Ohio was a big change from uh, New York. I, I've, I've got a, <clears throat> a business partner who lives in Columbus, Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, uh, it's not far from there where I was going to, to college. Exactly, and, uh, and and it has a. I think the local, uh, the main university there, our college is, is huge. I mean, I think the student population in Columbus is significant. Uh, the the reason I was reminded to think about that just now is because he wrote to me yesterday, uh, quite out of the blue, saying he'd done some of his ancestry stuff, and it turns out he's forty seven percent Scottish, <laughs> and he said, look. We've got some crazy politicians here. Could I perhaps gain entry to Scotland at some stage? I had to remind them that we've got equally crazy people here. So <laughs> I'm not sure that would be a major improvement. Anyway, that, that goes. So you, 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 you worked with labor unions. You spent some time in elementary school, primary school with very young children. Uh, I understand that you were very tired because my wife taught uh, elementary school, primary school for a number of years. and and including two-year-olds, uh, sorry, uh, five-year-olds. And she said that was exhausting. I mean, just because you've got to take care of everything apart from the teaching. <laughs> There's all sorts of other stuff. Two-year-olds are exhausting. That's for sure. I got it. Yeah. yeah, no, it was exhausting. And yeah, I did that. And then um, firing pan into the fire, I suppose. When I left, uh, when I graduated from Antioch, I went to... Um, uh, New upstate New Hampshire and uh, or northern New Hampshire and uh, lived in a town of 90 people for about 10, 12 years, I think. And so I've lived in a town of 90 people and I've lived in New York. So yeah. um, I know I, I have a huge fondness for um, small communities and I learned an awful lot. My One of my very best friends in the whole world 
is still my very best friend. And I met her in that little town of 90 people. So shout out to Norma. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I learned my lesson from that, aside from also, you know, how to pump, use a sump pump to, you know, take the, the flooding out of your cellar and all of those things was um, that there are wonderful women everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you end up in, uh, in Scotland? Oh, yeah. Well, um, so when I left uh, Antioch, I moved to New Hampshire and had a couple of kids, lovely, lovely kids and um, was, did a little bit of work um, uh, just in a factory, um, trying to first originally raise some money for, for Christmas, um, but uh, got fired because I was organizing a union. Um, and then, uh, but did some freelance editing and all that. As, you, as women do, you find some way to try and bring money in when you're um, parenting. And then my first job of paid work outside the home was working in a, um, a family planning agency and uh, run it. I was a manager there and worked in family planning for another 13 years, I think, um, in various, you know, um, jobs. And that was the other thing that has taught me so much. That was just, you know, if you, if you cut your teeth on reproductive health and you're and you work in the women's movement. Um, and at the time that I was working in family planning uh, was the time when clinic workers and doctors were being shot. You know, you, you, you become pretty, pretty hardened in your attitudes about who gets to tell women what they can do with their bodies. Yeah. So uh, that, was, that was really a great uh, experience for me. And I also did a lot of work with adolescents. And I, um, I, I think I have about 30 kids around the United States now <laughs> that, that, came, that came out of that work. They taught me so much. That's so cool. that's good. And then um, uh, when I left family planning, I went to work for the Bureau of Maternal and Child Health in the Department of Health and Human Services in New Hampshire. Um, and my, my, my baby was getting ready to go off to conservatory in New York. And I had to decide whether I wanted to probably stay in New Hampshire for the rest of my life. And I decided I probably didn't. And um, so I thought, well, maybe I should get a PhD. I was working for the maternal, Bureau of Maternal and Child Health, but it was pretty clear I wasn't gonna be able to be a civil servant for forever. And they were either gonna fire me or I was gonna have to find another job. <laughs> um, so I decided I should get a PhD and that maybe would mean that I could work independently, which um, seemed like a good idea at the time tried to find a good program in the US, really couldn't find one that suited me, ran across a website that said postgraduate opportunities in the UK, saw the University of Edinburgh on the list uh, and decided to apply. And much to my absolute surprise, I have to say, found myself here um, uh, a, while, a little while later and then I uh, thought, well, I'll just do this program where I can do a master's for a year in case I don't really want to be this far away from the U.S. And I, I'd been here two months when I knew that I was going to do everything I could to stay here. So. Cool. Cool. Well, we're glad that you made that decision. Thanks. Now, let's give a big shout out to Adam, shall we? Oh, my baby. Yeah. My, so my Adam, who went off to um, the new school's uh, school of jazz and contemporary music or something. It's called like that in New York, which is a great school. Um, he went off three weeks before I came to Edinburgh to do my PhD. Uh, one of us finished our degree, can I say, and that would not be him. Um, uh, but uh, he left school after about a year because he said musicians learn from playing, not being in school. And I think he probably was right. Anyway, he's, uh, he started out as a jazz and blues musician, um, really kind of became a bit more eclectic and then um, moved to Baltimore, started a band with his brother called Old Man Brown. Um, they, they had you know, learned a whole lot about being musicians during that process. And then moved, he, he, uh, his um, uh, brother died in 2004 
and he moved to uh, Nashville with his partner then um, and fiance now, uh, Jenny Lee. Um, and while playing piano in a, uh, you know, at a jam uh, uh, session um, in Nashville, he got a, a guy from The Voice came by and, you know, said, we think you should try out for The Voice. And um, this is a long story short because there's some other stuff involved. Mm. But anyway, he did wind up and yep, you know, I know you think that that audition that they do on television in the first show is the first audition, but that was like audition number five. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but anyway, he wound up um, uh, being the runner up. So he did really, really well. Uh, he's an amazing musician, I have to say. And, um, uh, uh, and, He's relatively successful and the voice really helped give him some visibility. You know, he, he can pay his bills most months um, uh, with music and he doesn't have to pay, paint houses anymore, which is what he was doing when he moved to Nashville. So yeah, that's a good thing. So it's thanks a for the shout out. Um, you can kind of tell that I'm pretty proud of him. You betcha. And I can understand why. I mean, to, to come almost number one in the voice is a big achievement. Because as you say, it's not it's not as straightforward as it looks on TV sometimes, <laughs> where you turn up and just say, "Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we just got struck my stuff and people mark me." Uh, yeah, it's what, it's all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, all this stuff, the crazy stuff. See, uh, that's been very very interesting. Uh, we'll come back to maybe some of those uh, uh, issues later, perhaps. I, I want to take some questions now, if I may, uh, and thank you to everyone who's been waiting patiently. Stephen Kelly is asking, oh, I should add a qualifier that uh, Marsha's not here tonight to answer questions about, you know, why the SNP does this and why the SNP does that or whatever, or doesn't. Uh, women for Independence is, is, is Women for Independence. It's not running or any part of the SNP. I'm right in saying that, aren't I? Well, thank you for bringing that up because um, we really do struggle with... Uh, people seeming to think that we are an arm of the uh, SNP or, or affiliated with any political party. And from our very roots in, our, um, uh, in 2012-13, um, we have been very careful not to have any um, uh, formal links with political parties. Now, lots of the women in, in, in Women for Independence um, do. And, you oh. know, you know, Jean Freeman, who was the cabinet secretary, was originally one of the founding members of Women for Independence. We've had members from the Green Party on our national committee, etc. cetera, but um, uh, I have no po political affiliation and thank goodness. Um, and, uh, and we like to really be clear that yeah. we don't have any loyalty in those directions. Yeah, okay, well, I'm glad we got that uh, set in place there, that's important. Um, Stephen Kelly is asking, is the women's movement for independence growing now in Scotland? Well, I mean, I think if you pay any attention to the polls, it will be unmistakable that, um, that there's been a major shift in how women um, are polling in terms of their attitudes about independence. Um, and I, you know, I think that, I don't know if I've seen the, all of them. I think there's been quite a number of them, but. It, I think we're looking at numbers that are um, around 60% positive. Yeah. And I think that um, pretty much in every poll, the women have polled more positive for independence than men, which is quite an interesting switch around. We find it quite amusing in women for independence in part because um, at the time of the 2014 referendum, there was some evidence-less, can I say, um, just speculations about whether the reason that women had voted no in, in slightly larger numbers than men was because women were risk averse. So we'd quite like to float the question now, what makes men in Scotland so risk averse? <laughs> um, however. Well, it, 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 I, I, maybe, maybe the question ought to be phrased slightly differently because uh, men and women under 21 appear to be you know, you're looking at 70% ratings for in the past. So it, it must be something that happens to people as they get older, perhaps they become risk averse. Uh, and, uh, but, but you're right, that, that the sophologists did say back then in 2014, the reason that fewer women were supportive was because, and I think the expression was, I'll try, I'm paraphrasing now, 
uh, women in general are more risk averse than men. I remember that. Do you remember that? Oh, do I? Do I? Because I found it highly it based on? Well, it wasn't based on any of the analysis of the research, I have to say, because we've looked at the research really carefully and we've had uh, a number of academics come and talk us through what we what we can learn from the from the um, demographics of the vote in 2014, yeah. and um, there are some really interesting things from that. But not that women are more risk averse. Um, you know, one of one of the things that we think is really interesting is that women um, get their information about making those decisions from different places. Um, and in, some of that will reflect the fact that women have significantly more on unpaid work and caring responsibilities in their lives, which means that they have a lot less time to watch television and read, you know, the, the, the daily news sheets. So they tend to get in and they have, a, I would say, a, um, a lower level of trust in those mainstream media yeah. um, sources. So. Um, so one of the, the ways that they are most likely to get their information is to, from uh, trusted sources like friends, yeah. family, peers, work, work, you know, yeah. co-workers. They also take longer to make their decision because they need more information to feel convinced. Yeah. And I think that was what, you know, made people say they they were risk averse, but just as many women decided and just as many women voted. So, yeah. it, you know, it's not, it, it, it is about gathering information. Um, and also they vote based on different things. So women are much more interested in, will, um, will something be good for us rather than will something be good for me? Yeah. So if we talked about the NHS, for instance, or we talk about public services, those are issues that are very resonant with women voters. Yeah. And they care a lot about that. And sadly, because so much of the discussion, I think, around in the first um, uh, referendum was around North Sea oil and the currency and the, and the issues that were clearly, you know, political pundits' for favorite thing to yeah. talk about, they had very little resonance for women. And then, of course, almost, especially in the beginning parts of the debate, almost all of the you know, the, the people who were on shows like this, the, the panels were men. Yeah. Um, and when you don't see yourself somewhere, you, you don't feel like anybody's talking to you. Yeah, yeah, so, I, think that, I think that's very important, I really do. Yeah. Uh, I'm reminded too, uh, I was a director in a, a, a bank for some time. And, uh, um, you know, it's very tempting for people to take stuff from banks <laughs> when you're an employee. <laughs> In the retail business, it's known as shrinkage. Uh, it's viewed rather more seriously in financial services. So we did surveys. Uh, when tellers stole, why did tellers steal? And there was a clear split. Um, the, the men stole to buy a motorbike, and the women, by and large, stole so their boyfriend could have a motorbike. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a name. There's, an, there's a whole piece of feminist economists commentary about how we how we model um, for our economy and one of the things that um, that a lot of us uh, argue for is that we move away from this breadwinner household um, yeah. model and the reason the reason that we need to move away from that um, in part is because men and women within the household first of all have very differential access to the in, to the house income in the household yeah um, and secondly Women have, let me see if I can remember this very geeky phrase, a um, uh, different uh, propensity to spend or marginal propensity to spend. That was it. And a big shout out to my lovely but, but um, deceased friend, Ailsa Mackay, um, uh, who taught me that phrase. So the, and that means that if women, women have um, uh, money, they are much more likely to spend it in their community and on their family, yeah. uh, and um, men are more likely to buy things like video games um, yeah. and other things with it. So what you get, what you pay for. So if you if you pay women, then 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 appropriately, then you'll get a very different investment in your in your country. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much for that. 
Um, Bob, Bob Matthewson is uh, asking, how, how do Americans feel about Scotland wanting to leave Westminster? I'm not suggesting you can speak for all Americans. I know, I love that question. Um, I, I don't know, Bob, how do all Scots feel about, but yeah. anyway, um, uh, although I do like to speak for the country, even though I haven't lived there for 20 years. I, I mean, I can tell you about my, my families and friends, many of whom you know, live in the United States. Um, and uh, I think their first reaction to it when I first started talking about independence in 2013 with them was, really? Really? Scotland wants to be separate because they've bought into this, you know, um, very stereotypical history that US yeah. history provides um, and an awful lot of around royalty. Um, however, I think as uh, they also ingrained in Americans is the right to self-determination. Yeah. And so I think um, a little bit of discussion uh, uh, distur disturbs them. It disturbs that automatic assumption that um, that the British uh, power um, structures based in London are actually likely to be good for people who don't live in that area. So yeah. they're, they're um, I think a lot of them are puzzled and, um, and don't get, and the reporting in the US is terrible about, yeah. and certainly was really terrible about the referendum, yeah. um, horrific. So um, they didn't get great news, but I think that, um, especially with the, you know, current, the last few inhabitants at 10 Downing Street, um, it's become clearer and clearer why we might, we might be interested in independence. Yeah, yeah. Do you think Joe Biden will bring about a significant change in US-UK relations? Uh, I, I, I don't think they change that much. And I don't think... I mean, I, I don't think Joe Biden's going to be radical about anything, frankly. So, um, but I also, you know, I know everybody makes a lot of his Irish background. Um, but I certainly think he will be much more sympathetic to, um, to the, you know, sort of anti-nuclear um, and climate change yeah. aspects of um, uh, some of the British uh, well, so, certainly couldn't say that it's anti-nuclear Westminster, but certainly some of the climate change um, issues and some of the the uh, more egregious stances on human rights and uh, immigration and refugees, yeah. his views will be more congruent with mm -hmm. um, uh, Westminster. It was noticeable that Obama, uh, you know, gave a lot of space to his vice president. Do you think Biden will reciprocate with his? I don't his? think he's got any choice. <laughs> She's a strong woman, and there are uh, an enormous number of women who are watching really carefully to see what happens with um, the way the White House uh, uses and, and you know provides her with a platform. And I, I, to be fair, I think he will. I don't. I and I think there's there's so much work to be done. By both of them. So. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, reading Obama's autobiography. You know, you, you could argue, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? But it, it, it does it does genuinely sound as if he gave lots of space to Biden as vice president and encouraged them to get involved in quite strategic ways, not in a peripheral go out and say nice things to the farmers and. <laughs> <laughs> the good folks in Minnesota, because I can't be troubled. I, I've got too much in my diary right now. But, but rather, uh, what do you think of what the defence chiefs are suggesting to me we ought to do in Afghanistan? Now, that suggests a high, very high level of involvement and, and not in any way peripheral. I mean, that's very central. If that's, if that's an accurate representation, and I've no reason to believe he would say something that is categorically untrue necessarily. So it suggested that Biden was very close to the centre of power in every sense not just in a yes. temple, perhaps. Yeah, and, and hopefully that's the role model he'll follow. I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how many of my women friends on both sides of the Atlantic um, 
uh, we were all texting each other when she took when uh, Kamala took the um, oath of office. And and um, and I was saying, oh, I'm I'm just going to watch. I wasn't going to watch the inauguration, but I just wanted to see that part. And um, uh, I did wind up watching quite a bit of it actually. But um, and and I I was like, well, I'll just watch this part. And then I was like, Whoa! and um and I, I have a really good really good friend who lives in Boston, and I, and so I texted her, and she's not exactly the touchy feely emotional type, right? Which I'm a little bit more on that spectrum. And uh, so I, I texted her and I said, oh, I'm feeling a little emotional. Um, and she goes, I'm crying my eyes out. So um, I think there were, there were women all over the world that were pretty affected by that. And we're, we're not going away, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it sounds like progress to me. Um, now, I, don't, I know you don't want to talk about the politics of stuff, uh, but in terms of... Uh, Here's a slightly general question. Jock Gibson is asking, how does Marshall, how does Marshall feel about this business about SNP one, uh, some other indie party number two, uh, you know, and the DeHaunt system? Uh, there's a feeling that if you vote SNP one and two, effectively what you do is you allow uh, opposition, uh, uh, but it, it might be possible to game the system and prevent that from happening if the vote is split between SNP1 and some other party like ISP2 or Greens or whatever. What, what's your sense of that? Have you, have you looked at that? Do you have a view on that? Um, no, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> oh, here's what I'm gonna tell you. So I, I find this, the vote system complicated and difficult to get my head around. And yep. That's complicated by the fact that I wasn't allowed to vote here for a very long time until I got my citizenship, which took me 13 years. So um, uh, I'm not really uh, sure what the implications are for Indy. I, it does seem to me that, um, that, that we need to remember that there is more than one independent supporting party um, and also, we have some politicians in multiple parties who said that that they that they are, you know, open to a free vote. That they are, um, uh, you know, they might not be looking forward to a second referendum. But if that's the will of the people, then that's the will of the people. I think yeah. we need to get out of the get out of the party um, uh, lines and and say, how can we build a coalition here? Yeah. Yeah. Can we move on to something uh, which is really central? I mean, and I suspect it inhibits and prevents and uh, discourages lots of women uh, from getting involved in politics is all the stuff on social media, the abuse, uh, which seems to be ongoing, if not increasing. Uh, I mean, What's your sense of that? Uh, is there anything that can be done, do you think? Or do we just have to sort of say, well, that's life. We can't control social media. There's always going to be these people around. We have to put up with it. What's your sense of this? Because it's directed a lot at women. It, yeah, it's, it's a very gendered thing. It's, and I'm not saying that men don't um, experience abuse online because they clearly do. Um, but it is, uh, if you look at a, a quite a... a um, old now study by the UN. I know because I wrote, I did a study, I did a, a wee literature review on um, some of this for the European Institute on Gender Equality a, n a number of years ago now. Um, and uh, they, the UN study said that women were 27 times more likely to experience abuse online than men. And um, we have to take that seriously. And I, and uh, you know, and that abuse takes lots of forms. It, you know, we're very familiar with it, certainly in the independence um, world, uh, in terms of discussing political issues. But you know, the 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 sh the sharing, the non-consensual sharing of intimate images, the um, uh, the fact that uh, women are stalked, you know, are by commercial the that perpetrators by um, uh, commercial spyware and stalk them using it. You know, there are, there are as many forms, you know, 
online or digital based abuse goes in and out of women's lives, um, just like the rest of the forms of abuse. Um, yeah. But in the in terms of uh, in the public sphere, uh, like uh, Twitter and Facebook and um, and all of those, really, when you think about it, what it does is the setting up of a toxic environment essentially um, silences a, a huge proportion of the potential audience yeah. and the potential um, uh, engage engagement. And if we think of a right to to be involved in public life as one of the human rights that we have, then then this kind of toxic um, uh, max masculinity that we see online um, is, a, is a huge violation of human rights. And uh, I think there is something, we don't know what the exact answer to that is, but I think I really welcome the fact that the Scottish Parliament um, uh, uh, and the Scottish government have gotten behind uh, a number, a coalition of women's organizations who have said, can we not think about a specific offense of, of um, misogyny and, and uh, misogynistic harassment um, and, and that could cover online harassment? So the, I think the, the membership for our committee to look at that headed by uh, Baroness Kennedy um, uh, had just been announced this week or last week. But, um, and, I, and that would be a really bold, exciting thing for Scotland to do because nobody else has figured out how to do this. Yeah. And the tools that we have in the toolkit are not working. Yeah. No, they're definitely not working. And it, it seems to me part of the problem is the fact that the people who provide the platforms, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you want to call it, are remote from here. They're not, you can't reach them very easily. Yeah. I mean, uh, how do you have a conversation with Facebook and say, I want you to stop this? It's the problem of global capitalism. I know. Yeah. I mean, that's part of it. And I know that we don't, you know, some of the, some of the tools that we might use are reserved. Um, so we would probably have a bit more opportunity uh, once, it, once we're independent for tackling this. Um, but I do think that uh, there's more than, it's, there's got to be there's got to be a regulatory, um, you know, uh, uh, intervention, um, but uh, a, probably a criminal justice one, and, and hugely a media literacy. You know, I think we should have mandatory training when, when in school about media literacy and understanding um, uh, how to understand and interpret what happens via the media. Um, you know, it's there's. It's a complicated problem and the answer is complicated, yeah. but it's not impossible. And I think, you know, I, I would think this, but based on my experience of working with the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish government to pass what is now called the world's gold standard um, uh, law on domestic abuse, I think that if it's going to happen anywhere, it could be here. Oh, that's interesting. Um, you say it's the gold standard. Mm -hmm. Um, were you involved in that? Were you involved in that legislation? Me and a whole lot of other pretty terrific people. Um, the, the, the process of um, developing the Domestic Abuse Scotland um, Act, which was passed in 2018, and is that gold world's mm -hmm. gold standard um, uh, law called that by Evan Stark, who wrote the book Coercive Control, from New York, it looks like me. Um, uh, the one of the things that sets that legislation aside from um, uh, pretty much anything else until maybe the Children's Scotland Bill um, uh, is the amount of uh, engagement with survivors that was involved in the in the crafting of that bill, and yep. uh, and in subsequent stages. And um, I, I'll be talking again, I gave evidence in the Australian parliament about it because they're so interested in what we did. Um, I know uh, some officials in Connecticut in the US are looking at our law. I mean, it's, it's mm. quite a bit around. The proof is still in the pudding, we have to make it work. And that is not easy, but um, it is a, you know, a groundbreaking piece of legislation. Yeah, maybe the vice president would be interested. Maybe she would. Although, you know, like in Scotland, um, the the jurisdiction for 
most criminal justice legislation is in the state. Is, this, is individual states? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess the White House could could uh... be influential. Yeah. Biden was involved in the original um, what they call VAWA over there. So the Violence Against Women Act, um, which needless to say, did did not prosper in the Trump um, yeah. administration. Uh, but so he'll have had, uh, and he had a lot of engagement around that. So yeah. despite a few other things in his background that um, were on, not along the same positive lines, that I think that's a good sign. Now, I know you don't want to get involved in politics, but, but we've been talking about abuse online and one of the, folks who suffered majorly with abuse is Joanna Cherry. And uh, it turns out that she's been demoted and uh, it almost looks like a double whammy. You know, you get abused and all of a sudden you lose your job. And uh, what's your take on that? Well, I'm going to preface this, as you know, by saying that we don't comment on internal party politics of any party. Um, although I would just say, I think it's quite unfortunate to conflate abuse with losing your job and, you know, in the, in the front bench of a party. Um, and I did see that Joanna tweeted this week that she'd had threats to her life. I, and I know that she's had, you know, really serious threats in the past and, and, um, and, uh, you know, she, she and I are not unknown to each other. Um, and did some campaigning together during the first referendum. Okay. And, and my heart goes out to her. And I, I'm really glad when she tweeted that she was safe. And I think that it's absolutely disgraceful that she should have any fears, any fears whatsoever. And like so many women, when you stick your head above the parapet, this is what happens. And Joe caught. Yeah. So um, I will really be clear about that. I think that um, I'm not going to comment on, uh, I do think that conspiracy theories are um, uh, as unlikely in this situation as um, in the, uh, the Trump's um, uh, previous uh, uh, discussions about the American elections. But um, uh, I think that uh, whoever is threatening her um, should have the full force of the law. And I, I do hope that, uh, that she feels the support of women across, across all sides of the independence debate, um, but certainly all of the women in the violence against women movement. Okay. Well, if you are in touch with Joanna, uh, feel free to extend an invitation from us to her if she would like to come on the show and talk. Um, you know, she's pretty good at reading her email, I suspect. So if you just well, we, we, probably did, go. We, we did try that. So that's why we're... we're so I got, well, I, I have no influence over Joanne, I have oh. to say. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but she's very welcome. I mean, if she's watching this, you're very welcome. Uh, Joanna, come on the show and, and, and tell us how you feel. Uh, so maybe part of what goes on in political parties isn't very well understood by people in general uh, that you know political parties are, are not some uh, placid sea of uh, conformity uniformity <laughs> it's no pleasure cruise i suspect no i know <laughs> well i i mean i think you know first of all i just have to call you on saying well, i know you don't like to talk about politics well everything we talked about here and we'll talk about is politics it's just not party politics. Party politics and yes. I think Scotland has a real, you know, a, a lot of, I will tell you that it was one of the cultural shocks to me when I moved to this country was this, you know, I think people call it tribalism, but I just find the, the level of debate and the question time interactions sophomoric really. Yeah. And I, at sometimes, and I, and I, I don't know what the answer is because I do know, I mean, I've spoken to, to, to MSPs from various parties about it, and they don't like it either. Yeah, they have no, you know, they it, it, the the way the power struggles are set up, they don't have an option. So yeah. I do think that God in a new in a new Scotland, please can we find a way around that kind of ongoing argy bargy, which does nobody oh. any good. Yeah, so that would be one thing I would have to say. I, I think everyone watching and listening would agree with that. 
uh, we, we've tried to examine this in past shows and one of the conclusions that keeps drifting to the top of the discussion is uh, the tabloid, tabloidization of, of the media. You know, if it bleeds, it leads. It's, it's easy, it's cheap, uh, it's impactive, but it's not particularly educational. Uh, and very few people are aided by two people yelling at each other, which is one of the reasons that we have this show, by the way. You know, not, not, not to be over effusive about it, but the fact of the matter is folks get a chance to talk and it's not about, you know, the, the trivia, which, is, which goes on a lot of the time, which is, I find deeply upsetting. We Can I just say that one of the reasons that I think women are beginning to come over to independence, um, uh, or at least one of the reasons why we enjoyed some success as a, as a non-party aligned um, group of women, is that we, you know, the, our, the, first, the first rule of Women for Indy is listen, listen first. Yeah. And the second rule is talk about things that matter to women. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is, the third thing really is to do politics differently, which means, you know, no shouting, you know, no, uh, no point scoring if we can avoid it, you know, just, trying to genuinely find out how the other people feel and move, and help them move to a place where we can make a better country and a better world. And, um, and when, we, when we put aside some of that other stuff and we try and find a place, you know, it's, it's one of the things that we talk about a lot in Women for India is um, who are the soft mm -hmm. nose? And, yeah. you know, so many people in Scotland grew up being in the Labour Party so many people and their parents. And, you know, if, if you spend your time arguing about labor, pol you know, labor party politics or, you know, SNP, you know, you lose an opportunity to talk to people about freedom yeah. and democracy. And I, you know, I, I feel like I've just, you know, we're a bit like a, a broken record, but at the end of the day, if you can't listen first, you can't be part of the discussion. Exactly, exactly. Somebody who's been listening tonight is uh, Kim Nichol, who's saying uh, many organizations like Women's Aid who work with women and their families affected by domestic abuse are facing financial cuts. Would Marsha like to see mainstream funding for these services? You know, I could have paid her to ask that question. I didn't but I could have because it is so dear to my heart. And, and I am constantly trying to, we are at Scottish Women's Aid at the moment, um, constantly trying to problem solve how to restructure the way services are funded because what we have is a network of 36 services that um, have suffered serious uh, local budget cuts. Oh, well, austerity is what started it. And austerity has never gone away for women's aid groups. And um, I can tell you three local authorities that have put out for competitive tendering their domestic abuse services, Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire are the, the newest ones. And um, uh, in the face of a, an enormously enabling environment politically around domestic abuse, and yet I am, I am petrified that with what I think are, is the coming economic pressures from COVID, that we are, um, that we are gonna lose significant parts of this network of domestic abuse services, just as the need for them spirals up. And unless we restructure the way that funding is, is provided so that it is not, um, uh, there's not this huge divide between the funding that comes from the Scottish government and the funding that comes from local authorities and community planning partnerships, then then we are we have broken our promise to the people of Scotland that and to the women and children of Scotland that they will have equal access to services because we will see some parts of that network disappear. Yeah, well, that's that's exceptionally disheartening to hear that because I, you know I can't see COVID disappearing anytime soon, and even when it does, if that's that's going to happen in the say the year, next year. Uh, I'm sure it will leave a lasting impact. I'm not, I'm not sure any of us are going to go back to normal again after this. 
So, I mean, what can you do in these circumstances? You know, knowing that your the demand is almost certainly going to increase, but the actual resources are fewer. Yeah. Well, I mean, what we're not even arguing at this point that to give women's aid more women's aids more money although they need more money um the pie needs to be bigger but um what we are arguing is that they need sustainable dependable and stable funding yeah. it's not at the whim of who of of you know folks who are um don't understand how yeah. domestic abuse works so yeah. You know, we've, we've been um, in some really productive conversations with the Equality Unit and talking about how what a restructure might require. And we have international commitments already um, that would require that we have a minimum level of services. So we just need to define what the, that minimum level should be. And okay. then we should have a, have a way of protecting that. And whether that requires legislation or regulation, I'm not clear. Um, mostly what it requires is political will. And that's, that's what I'm worrying about, making a transition when you have an election in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense. Um, if you had a, a message to give to people tonight about Women for Independence and about SWA, so that's two messages, really, uh, maybe a couple of sentences on each, what would you say? Um, I think, interestingly for me, you know, they are both my passion and um, Women for Indy is totally volunteer. We have a tiny uh, in a number of hours a month paid for a coordinator that, that uh, you know, uh, is helps people join and, you know, do the website and things like that. Um, but the history of Women's Aid is almost exactly the same which is, you know, that, that women's aid started around women's kitchen tables when they were talking about the state of the world and how the status quo was not acceptable. And they went out and they found ways to create safe places for women who are fleeing um, domestic abuse. And um, at 40 years later, you know, you have the, the world's gold standard legislation and it's, uh, it's, it's women like myself who were standing on the shoulders of those women who did that. And Women for India, I think, very much looks the same. You know, the, the, those women, the thousand plus women who packed into that church in Perth after the, the referendum vote and said, we're not going back to our sofas. That's the same kind of grassroots, you know, make the change you want to see. And... I really hope that if there's anybody out there who has women in your life who you, you think would maybe be interested in talking about freedom and democracy and, and be part of the, of the movement, whether they're ready to vote yes or not, then yeah. introduce them to somebody in Women for Indy. Okay, that's good advice, folks. Everybody watching tonight, uh, you've heard it straight from uh, Marsha, and she knows what she's talking about. Look, it's been absolutely splendid. Thank you very much, Marsha. Uh, the, uh, the 60 minutes has flown by, <laughs> as it always does. <laughs> it seems like we just got started and we're almost through. Um, a big thank you to you. Uh, and I have to say a few things about, in conclusion, about the show uh, and about the other elements of uh, Indie Live. Uh, next week, we are back with Cathy McCullough, now, Kathy is director of the Children's Parliament. And if you believe, like most of us do, that children are our future, uh, then you really don't want to miss next week with Kathy. And you can send her, uh, you can send us any questions for her. And look out for the Constitution column in the Sunday National. I'm not sure if I'm doing it this week or it may well be Elliot Boomer. And very importantly, support Indie Live, please. Indie Life has a cornucopia. I keep saying this, but it's true. They have masses and masses of other shows in addition to the TNT show. And you can make a donation there as well if you like. And this is very important. If you're interested in what you've heard tonight, go to the whatsonguide.scot and you'll see a list of all these other programs and what's coming up on the TNT show as well. Uh, thank you again and a very good night to everyone. Join us next Wednesday. And remember, 
It's been a great day for British democracy. Good night, everyone. Thanks again, Marsha. Thank you, John. It's been lovely.